This little blue suppository next to me is a Reliant Robin. It's three-wheeled, made of fiberglass, named after a bird, made in England, mid engine single-wipered, and it belongs to me. I bought a Reliant Robin. And yes, I have seen that episode of Top Gear, so please don't tell me about it. Oh crap, this is the internet, now everyone's gonna tell me about it. For those of you unfamiliar with the Reliant Robin, here's your crash course. Maybe I shouldn't say crash. The Reliant Robin was a car produced in Tamworth in the north of England by the British car company Reliant. The original Robin was produced from 1973 up until 1981. Then in 1982, Reliant released a new car called the Rialto, which was basically the same thing as the original Robin, but with some slightly different bodywork. The Rialto was produced all the way up until 1997. Then in 1989, Reliant decided to bring back the Robin nameplate. This new and improved Mark II Robin was basically the same car as the Rialto, but with some slightly different bodywork. Oh, and the Robin and Rialto, which were basically the same car with different faces, were produced and sold at the same time for eight years, from 1989 all the way up until 1997. The Mark III Robin, which is what mine is, was introduced in 1999. It had such dazzling changes as some new body panels and headlights from a Vauxhall Corsa. My Robin is a 99 model. The Mark III Robin was made until 2001 when Reliant went out of business. There were also some Robins made under license by a plastic company in 2002, but they only made like 40 of them, so eh. I mean, that company, which was called b &N Plastics, by the way, did rework the interior of the Robin and add things like electric windows, which had never before been seen in a Robin. But again, they only made like 40 of them, so whatever. The body of the Reliant Robin is made of fiberglass. Fiberglass is what Reliant was known for. Well, that and making silly little three-wheel cars that go whoop around corners. The Reliant Robin is the second most produced fiberglass car in history, second only to the Corvette. Or so says Wikipedia. I couldn't find any production numbers to back up that claim. I couldn't even find how many Reliant Robins they produced in total, so that could be a myth for all I know. The frame is made from steel, galvanized in the case of the Mark III. The fourth wheel only exists in your dreams. They are all front mid-engine, rear-wheel drive, have a Reliant-made aluminum block four-cylinder engine and a four-speed manual transmission. And yes, that four-speed manual transmission does have a reverse gear. Apparently some people think it doesn't have a reverse gear. It does. From 73 to 75, the engine in the Reliant Robin was a 750cc engine, making a whole 32 horsepower. From 75 onward, the engine in the Robin was an 850cc single carbureted, single SU carbureted four-cylinder engine making 40 horsepower. Now there were variations of this engine over time, like one made with lower compression for better economy, and one made with hardened valve seats for unleaded fuels. How advanced, but it was the same basic 850cc single SU carburetor engine that was used in all Robins from 1975 all the way up until 2001. Now supposedly the Mark III Robin can manage 60 to 100 miles per gallon. I've read that in a few places, but since that's such a massive range, I don't believe it. Maybe I'll test it out myself at some point. This car was imported a number of years ago by a fish and chip shop in New York where it was used as delivery car. They also wrapped it in a silly Union Jack vinyl wrap and a plethora of dumb stickers. Hence this shirt. This is, this is that car. But your car didn't come with a shirt. That fish and chip shop went out of business at some point and this Robin was then sold to a guy. And then that guy sold the Robin to another guy, a fellow Trabot owner in Tennessee who we'll call Ron Funkmaster. Mr. Funkmaster had his fun in this car for a few months and then decided to sell it, at which point he called me. And now I have a Reliant Robin. Yeah, as far as I know, this is the only Mark III Reliant Robin in the entirety of the United States. And it belongs to me, the premier collector of unusual, slow, and badly made death traps. When I brought it home, it had a small gas leak from one of the fuel lines and it had a small coolant leak from a small hole in one of the coolant lines. Both of these things were very easy to fix and the car has been trouble free ever since. Aside from a wee bit of overheating, but it is hot out. And yes, if you're curious, it is licensed as a motorcycle. I've got the tiny plate to prove it. I've been driving around my little blue suppository a lot lately, so I feel qualified to answer the question you may all be wondering. What's a Reliant Robin actually like? It's terrible, but that's good because it means I like it. 
Let's forget about the three-wheeliness of it all for a minute. This is a car from 1999 that has no power windows, no power locks, no power steering, no ABS, unassisted drum brakes, no airbags, no air conditioning, no fuel injection, no automatic choke, and no place to put your left foot when it's not on the clutch pedal. This is an extraordinarily basic car that has evolved very little from its debut in 1973, aside from changes in the bodywork, which are pretty well irrelevant and cosmetic. If you compare this to a basic economy car from 1973, it looks all right. If you compare it to a basic economy car from 99, well, it's a bit like comparing a proper desk to a sheet of plywood on top of two sawhorses. It'll work, but it's missing some features and stability. I mean, forget about the whole three-wheeled thing for a moment. Can you imagine a 99 Corolla with a carburetor and unassisted drum brakes? Anyway, would you like a tour of this three-wheeled wonder? Of course you would. Let's start with the undercarriage. Man, that's an outdated term, isn't it? Undercarriage? Let's look at the underside of my horseless carriage. Anyway, here it is. I've already mentioned this thing is front mid-engined, and this is why. They needed all that space up front for the wheel, so they had to push the engine back, back here. As you can see, around the front wheel is a whole heck of a lot of nothing. It's a big empty void of fiberglass undersides. You can see the massive, hilarious steering linkage up here, and it is not rack and pinion, it is a pitman arm assembly. Just a big old giant linkage going up to the front wheel. Here in the middle-ish is the engine and transmission. The engine was already coated in oil, and then it ran over some dirt, so now it's coated in dirt. As you can see, this car is the very definition of body on frame. It's got a steel, galvanized steel, ladder frame chassis, and a fiberglass body bolted right on top of it. In the back, you've got your Ford Pinto style gas tank mounted all the way in the back and your live rear axle. That's pretty much it. Not that interesting of a car. Pretty simple. This Robin is an estate with a hatchback. Robins and Rialtos were available as sedans, hatchbacks, estates, and panel vans throughout the years, but the Mark III Robin was only available as an estate and a panel van, which are basically the same thing. The panel van just didn't have any windows or back seat. This is the rear wiper. It works exceedingly well. This is the rear washer jet, and opposing the rear washer jet for some simple semblance of symmetry is the radio antenna. It's okay. Up front you can see the lovely rounded nose and sleek Vauxhall Corsa headlights. Apparently this was the first Robin designed on a computer. It doesn't really mean much, I could draw something in Microsoft Paint and say I designed it on a computer, but it looks all right, so I won't complain. This flimsy flap of fiberglass up here is the part of the car that steals from the rich and gives to the poor with its band of merry men. Which doesn't make any sense if you call this a bonnet. And there's not a lot to see under here. The bulk of what you can see here is the heater core and duct hoses that go into the cabin. There's also various fluids, the world's smallest radiator, the battery, which fouls on the hood, various hoses, the fuse box, which has all of four fuses in it, and just the front of the engine. Most of the engine is crammed into the dash of the car. If you want to fiddle with the engine, it's most likely you'll be doing so from inside the car. Pressed right up against your leg in either front seat is the engine access hatch. On the driver's side, you have access to things like the starter motor, oil filter, fuel pump, and distributor. You can clearly see the proudly branded Reliant engine block. The passenger side hatch is where you have access to the exhaust, carburetor, and Lucas Electric's alternator. Side note, that engine access hatch on the passenger side gets real hot, because, you know, the exhaust is right there, and there's no heat shielding. I have to imagine from the factory there was some form of heat shielding, but there sure isn't now. Maybe that fish and chip shop put their food deliveries right next to that hatch. It's like a warming oven, but carbureted. Like I said, there is just one windshield wiper, and it's mostly adequate, except it does miss this corner here, which happens to be right in front of my face, maybe I'm just too tall for the car. I mean, my knee also hits the blinker stalk, so that lends credence to that theory. But the upside is I can honk with my knee. The dashboard in here is straight out of the 70s. It's comparable to, say, a Mark I Golf, but cheaper. The only thing on the passenger side is a glove hole. In the middle is the radio, obviously aftermarket. There's two dials, a voltmeter, and a clock, and yes, the clock does work. You just can't set the time on it because the knob's broken off, and in the middle there is a fresh air vent. All the way at the bottom, right above the shifter, is the all-important ashtray, and above that are two cable pulls. The one on the right actuates the carburetor choke, and yes, it is a manual choke. And the one on the left is the heater valve. This knob pulls the cable that controls the heater control valve, which controls how much engine coolant is flowing through the heater core. The fan speed control is, logically, all the way on this side of the dash, nowhere near the heater control, and it's unlabeled. 
I have to assume that it was labeled at one point, but it's not labeled now. Side note, my heater fan doesn't work. There's power going to the leads, but the fan no worky. Second side note, I still have heat in the car despite this because the air rushing in the front still passes over the heater core and into the cabin out the heater vents. This is how I found out there's no way to turn off the defrost vents. There's four vents going into the car. There's two vents that have little flaps over them under the dash, and then there's the two defrost vents that naturally point at the windshield. You can shut off the two heater vents with the little flaps that are on them, but there will always be fresh air flowing into the cabin through the two defrost vents, and the only control you have over that is how warm that air is. Can't turn it off. Gauges. It's a word with silly spelling, and it's just about the only thing that changed on the inside of the Robin from 73 to 2001. This is what the instrument panel looks like in a Mark III Reliant Robin. If you're wondering what all the unlabeled idiot lights mean, they're the blinkers. Yes, there's just one light for those. The brights, the low oil pressure warning, and the alternator warning light. In a classic Porsche 911, the gauge they put right in the center of the gauge cluster, right in the center of your attention, is the tachometer because that's what Porsche felt was most important for the driver to see at every glance down to the gauge cluster. Did you notice what gauge was right in the middle of the Robin's gauge cluster? It's the coolant temperature. Make of that what you will. These switches to the left do various things to the lights. There's the headlights, the fog lights, the behind you fog lights, and the hazardous lights. The switches on the right, which are arranged in a completely different pattern for whatever reason, control the rear window defroster, the rear window wiper, the heater fan, and Something else. I don't know what this switch does. It lights up when I press it. I don't know what it does. On the left of the steering column is the stalk that controls your blinkers, brights, and... The horn! <laughs> it's not working! It's not working! <laughs> oh, there it goes. The stalk on the right controls the wipers. As I already mentioned, there's no airbags in here, but at the very least, you have a nice soft rubber pad in the middle of the steering wheel. I mean, your head's gonna collide with the rim of the wheel long before it hits this soft rubber pad, but it's the thought that counts. They could have put a spike coming out of the middle of the wheel. That'd be worse. The front seats are, well, they're front seats. I don't know if they're correct for the Reliant Robin, but they seem to fit, aside from this chunk of wood that's propping up the seat cushion. Robins are supposed to have a back seat. Mine does not. That's probably for the better, though. It doesn't look like this back seat would be useful unless you're one of those people that isn't burdened with having bones. These side mirrors are wrong for the car, but at least they don't work. I was told by the guy that sold me this car that all I have to do to make these mirrors work is to reach out the window and angle them up slightly so I can see out of them. But if I do that, all I see is my arm. So that advice was about as useful as these mirrors. Here's the door panel. And yes, these doors do not have detents in them. And the only thing keeping the door from opening too far is a leather strap. The back of the car is surprisingly spacious. Now, that's partly because there's no back seats in here like there should be, but I'm still impressed. There is no spare tire in the spare tire well because spare is too big. And there's currently no speakers in the car because when Mr. Funkmaster had this car, there was a built-in box back here that was spanning about this space. They had like 20 speakers, a couple amps, and 15 subwoofers or something and he removed it, which of which I'm thankful because this is totally the wrong sort of car for that sort of setup. I mean, I'd argue that any car is the wrong sort of car for that many speakers, but that's just like my opinion, man. And that's pretty much it. It's a pretty simple car, if you can call it a car. Now, like I've said many times, this whole thing is made out of fiberglass, the whole body, which makes it very light. This whole car, engine and everything, weighs under a thousand pounds, just under a thousand pounds. That's 450 kilograms if you come from the land where pounds means money and Reliant Robin means local production. And I think that's the end of the tour. I should know, I scripted this whole video. Let's take this thing for a drive now. I'll start with the subjective. I love driving this thing. It makes me happy. In the few weeks I've owned this car, I've been driving around every chance I can possibly get been going to eat groceries in it, chicken food, parts, whatever. I've been driving it around as much as possible. Why wouldn't I? I've got a throaty little engine sitting right here, basically hugging my leg. I've got a direct and notchy gear change with the stick going straight into the transmission down here. It gives me all those old car feels and sounds that I like, despite not being that old of a car. Everyone else on the road loves it because it's small, adorable, and it has one less wheel than the car they're driving. It has a top speed of 85 miles an hour, so I can drive it basically anywhere. I can take it on city streets. I can take it on the highway. 
I can even take it on the interstate if I'm feeling especially brave. Although I do have to admit the engine's a little weak, so I have trouble going up hills. And I try not to go above 65 miles an hour because above that speed, the engine starts getting a little buzzy, but those are really minor complaints. And when I'm driving cars like this, I like to see myself as sort of a caretaker as well as just a driver. Now, if I can toss subjectivity to the side for a moment and try to view the driving experience of this car from a normal, normal person's perspective, uh, this thing is terrible to drive. For starters, it has the wonderful combination of being narrower than most cars and mid-engine. So I'm sitting here in the driver's seat crammed between the door and the engine hub. And the engine hub has very little in the way of insulation. Basically, all you get is the carpet that's around it. So it's about as hot and loud as a volcano during mating season. My feet come to a point in the footwell. There's very little in the way of safety devices and I'm in near constant danger of the door becoming the new bottom of the car. Now, naturally, I consider the, all of these things a bonus because, well, they add character and entertainment value while I'm driving, but to the average person, I imagine these aren't exactly bonuses and that would make it a terrible driving experience. Let's talk about stability. I have more of it because I'm on antidepressants, and a Robin has more of it than you would think. You know that episode of Top Gear with the tumbling Robins? Yes, it was hilarious, but it was also a bit misleading. Robins don't tip over quite that easily. Whee! The cars they used to make that episode were modified. They fitted two different sized wheels to the rear axle, welded the rear differential, and added a lot of extra weight to the driver's side for extra flippiness. As far as how they made that one do a wheelie, I don't really know. They must have added an elephant to the trunk because as it sits, there's really no weight behind the rear axle at all, except maybe the gas tank. The engine's all the way up there. In reality, the Robin doesn't flip over quite as easily as they made it look. Whee! Obviously, it's not difficult. I mean, just look at it. The front wheel's like a freaking teeter-totter. But it's not comically easy either. The steering is fairly heavy, and the live rear axle has a pretty hefty anti-roll bar given the size of the car and it has an open differential, which is helpful because if you get the car up on two wheels, all the engine power will be sent to the free spinning wheel that's not on the ground, and the car slows down and settles back down, which is something that I actually experienced. I took a corner just a wee bit too hot, got it up on two wheels, and the free spinning inside wheel went and the car slowed down because there was no power being sent to the ground, and I was basically saved by the open differential. It would have been saved if I you know, didn't take the corner too fast, but whatever, the car saved me. The reality is, I'm constantly aware of the tipping hazard, not constantly afraid of it, and that's kind of the difference. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. I have a Robin now. As far as plans go, I don't really have many plans for this thing. It's not in the best cosmetic shape. There's quite a bit of cracking around the gel coats, and the interior is a little bit shabby. So maybe I'll tinker with it and improve on it in the future. Regardless of what I do with this thing, I'm going to have a blast with it. It's in pretty good mechanical shape, so I don't have to worry about that for at least a little while. Maybe I'll change the oil. I don't know. I'm going to have a hoot with it, and I'll probably get up to some antics, like testing how easy it is to roll a Robin, or at least get it up on two wheels. So anyway, thanks for watching. I have a Reliant Robin. I'll see you in the next video.